Uh, good evening, everyone. What an amazing crowd. And you were very wise to show up tonight because it's going to be an incredible event. Um, thank you all so much for coming. I'm Melissa Muscatine. I'm co-owner of Politics and Prose along with my husband, Brad Graham, who very regrettably could not be here because he really wanted to be. But he's in Italy, so <laughs> you, know, you don't have to feel too sorry for him. Um, but anyway, I am, I am very delighted to be here. And, and on behalf of our incredible staff, we welcome you all to tonight's event. I'm just going to run through a few housekeeping matters before we get started. Uh, there are plenty of books, um, and, and Dana will be signing at the end. So if you don't have a copy yet, please feel free to go to the register and pick one up. Purchase one, I mean. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we do want to stay in business, and we do want him to stay in business. Um, at the end of the event, if you wouldn't mind folding up your chairs and putting them against a solid object like a wall or a bookcase, it will help facilitate the signing line, and it will also help out our staff. If you have a question when we get to the Q&A, please come up to this microphone. I know it's a pain, but if you can come up to the microphone, we are recording this event, and it really helps for the people watching the event on a video um, and on our YouTube channel to be able to hear the questions. So uh, that would be great if you could do that. And I think that is the housekeeping. Oh, we would uh, encourage you to wear masks. We don't require it, but for the safety of everyone around you and our staff, if you happen to have a mask and don't mind putting it on, that would be great. If you don't and would like one, our staff can get one for you. Um, and if you just don't want to wear them, that is your prerogative. So uh, thank you so much uh, for that. Um, and now um, and now on to the good part. Um, it is such, a, such an honor and such a pleasure to welcome uh, Washington Post columnist Dana Milbank here to PNP tonight for a discussion of his new book, The Destructionists, The 25-Year Crack-Up of the Republican Party. Uh, and whether you're a diehard Washington political junkie, which I'm sure some of you are, or a casual consumer of news, or just totally oblivious, uh, The Destructionist is a must-read. And it's a must-read because it explains with clarity and conscience how the Republican Party morphed from protector of conservative ideology to a fascist cult built around a demagogue. Dana traces the GOP's, <laughs> Dana traces the GOP, 
I don't think I was exaggerating, was I? <laughs> that was a pure statement of fact. We're all about facts and evidence. So <laughs> as you hear him, you'll know that I was speaking the utter truth. Um, Dana traces the GOP's transformation beginning with the rise in the 1990s of Newt Gingrich and his brand of disruptive and destructive politics to the authoritarianism of Donald Trump and the insurrection of January 6, 2021 and everything in between. Dana connects all the dots. Sadly, there are lots of dots to connect. As with all of Dana's work, The Destructionist is beautifully written and engrossing, but I'm not gonna lie. This book will not help you sleep at night. <laughs> the story Dana knits together is, in a word, terrifying. What has happened over the past 25 years is actually far worse than you think. So if you care about the foundation of a democracy and belief in humanities, and you believe in humanity's general goodness, be prepared for a deep new bout of anxiety when you read this book. <laughs> but there's a bright side. <laughs> the Destructionist is also in many ways an expose. Uh, here's how they did it, here's how it happened guide for those determined to salvage American democracy, the rule of law, and civility and decency. Dana, of course, is the perfect person to explain the crack up of the grand old party. He's been a nationally syndicated columnist at the Washington Post for 17 years, and before that, covered national politics for the Post, the New Republic, and the Wall Street Journal, where he also reported from the London Bureau. He provides commentary on several TV networks. The Destructionist is his fourth book. It is not only a tour de force, but I consider it an act of public service. Um, and we are delighted also to have Karen Finney with us tonight to be in conversation with Dana. Karen's career over the last half century, half century, sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry. She's not that old. <laughs> She's not that old, my bad, my bad. Quarter century, 25 years. <laughs> Karen's career over the last 25 years, <laughs> just to be clear, has spanned politics, government, advocacy, and communications. Some of you may know her from her commentary on CNN and her show on MSNBC that was called Disrupt with Karen Finney. She has served as a senior advisor to Georgia gubernatorial candidate Stacey Abrams, spokesperson for the Democratic National Committee, senior advisor and spokesperson for Hillary Clinton's 2016 presidential campaign, has worked on five presidential campaigns, was a staffer in the Clinton White House, has served on several nonprofit boards and currently is vice chair of the board of NARAL Pro-Choice America, among other boards she still serves on. A former fellow at the Institute of Politics at Harvard, she is a sought after political and communications consultant here in Washington. Most important to me, Karen is a dear friend and former colleague, dating back to our days working together for President and Hillary Clinton in the White House, she is a wonderful, wonderful person. So it is a personal pleasure to have here, her here tonight with Dana. Please join me in welcoming Dana Milbank and Karen Finney. Is this on? Oh, it is. Um, I feel like I shouldn't say anything after that introduction. Like Let's I just leave it at that. Yeah, like, okay, it's good, we're good. We just feel great, that's why. So I had, uh, so Larissa mentioned that we worked for the Clinton. So I did kind of feel off the street on this book. Uh, it's only fair to ask, is this proof that the right wing, vast right wing conspiracy truly exists? <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe not. A maybe. fine question. <laughs> um, let me answer that by first thanking you all uh, for coming here. Thank you, Alyssa, for that uh, undeservedly kind introduction. Thank you, Karen, my friend, uh, for doing this. Thank you, my wife, for <laughs> telling me to talk into the microphone. My family's here, my daughter's in the back. I see so many friends out here. I think I see my researcher, Erin Doherty, who made this book happen. I just put my name on it, but she did the work. <laughs> Um, and yes, there is a, uh, there is a vast right-wing uh, conspiracy. There's also a vast left-wing conspiracy. <laughs> it's called the Deep State, and you are it. <laughs> right here. I know you've just crawled out of the basement of Comet Ping Pong, and you didn't, you didn't even know, you went through the tunnels, you didn't even have to go outdoors. <laughs> yes, Rush Limbaugh used to accuse me of that all the time. Um, in all seriousness, Let's start with, there's a little bit of news that I think very well it, um, leads into the theme of this book, and that is Liz Cheney lost her re-election. Mm -hmm. I don't think that was a surprise. 
But I thought one of the places I would start is, you know, you, in this book, make the, the case that, in some ways, oh, these are my words, not yours, Trump was sort of inevitable based on, if you look at where, the, if you starting with Newt Gingrich um, and around four themes, which we'll talk about, mm -hmm. that Trump was kind of, what, or the way I would like to say it is, the GOP made this party themselves. I mean, this is the right. trouble they made for themselves. But does that also mean that someone like Liz Cheney losing was also inevitable in 2022? I, I would say it, it was inevitable. And I'm going to go back, not to 1994, although we'll probably do a lot of that with uh, Newt Gingrich, but back to 1999, when I was on uh, 727 with the words Trump on the, on the tail and a, a, a would-be candidate Trump who wanted to uh, uh, run for president on the Reform Party ticket at the time, and his potential rival for the nomination was one Pat Buchanan. And Donald Trump, he was there with Roger Stone and Roger Stone's uh, poodle, I think, at, at the time. Um, so he, uh, he had uh, positioned himself as an abortion rights uh, uh, supporter, uh, as a supporter of universal health care, and his whole campaign out there, we were out in Los Angeles, he went to the, the, the Wiesenthal Center, uh, and the whole idea was he was campaigning on the theme of racial tolerance, yeah. in contrast to that guy, <laughs> Pat Buchanan. Um, so the, the argument of the book is that Donald Trump was really just a reflection of the Republican Party. He did not cause the problem. Uh, he's a symptom of the problem, uh, a problem that began in earnest with the Republican Revolution of 1994, uh, worsened uh, a lot during the uh, the Karl Rove dominated uh, years and the uh, uh, the Iraq War. Uh, worsened yet again uh, during uh, the Tea Party and, and the birtherism and uh, uh, the uh, rise of Sarah Palin. So the first rise of Sarah Palin. She may be back now too. Uh, and then uh, Donald Trump basically converted into you know he saw where the Tea Party was going. He. Uh, jumped in front of it. He uh, started the uh, birther movement uh, on on Fox News. You know, he he basically held up a mirror. I call him the monster that uh, the Republicans uh, created. And th so th the the bad news there is that even if he hadn't existed, somebody like him would have existed because we were heading uh, in that direction. And even when he's gone, sooner than later, but <laughs> um, it in in a sense it doesn't necessarily matter. Uh, because Trumpism won't be gone. Uh, so that is going to be, uh, in the party's going to be in the throes of that, you know, probably for another couple of decades. Uh, so I wrote the book to give people a sense of where we are, uh, uh, where we're going, and hopefully to give people some sense of that there's, w it's worth fighting to preserve some of the things we still have. Right, there's still hope. We're going to end with that. Oh, there, I promise right, you there's right some hope. <laughs> so le let me ask you this question. So then, Let's talk about 1994 and Newt Gingrich. You know, why start there? Why do, why do you posit that that was such a pivotal moment in the Republican Party and this journey towards becoming the destructionist? Mm -hmm. So uh, Newt, uh, he, he rises to speaker with the revolution of 94, but he, he became an important figure even before that bringing down uh, Speaker Jim Wright uh, with a, a whole bunch of uh, ethics allegations that in their first instance turned out to be false, and uh, the ones that did turn out to be true, it turned out Newt Gingrich himself <laughs> had done very <laughs> similar things that uh, he was later reproached by the, by the House for doing. But that's, he, he rose as a bomb thrower, replacing uh, Bob Michael, who had been the, uh, uh, a member of the greatest generation, led Republicans in the House through the Reagan years very successful in uh, negotiating much of, of the Reagan agenda. He didn't like Newt Gingrich's pyrotechnics and uh, uh, essentially forced him uh, to quit because he said he was going to run against him uh, and oust him uh, as the Republican leader. Uh, but Newt, even in 1990, as he was making his rise, when he sent out that famous memo, you know, how to talk like Newt, uh, you want to refer to Democrats as traitors. Um, you want to uh, refer to them as evil, as corrupt, uh, uh, as uh, abusing their power. Uh, this was an innovation. You know, people didn't talk like that then. Uh, certainly somebody who's going to be Speaker of the House uh, didn't talk like that then. 
Uh, and, and Newt had uh, somewhat uh, famously said the problem uh, with re the Republican Party is they don't teach you to be nasty enough. Right. Well, they have fixed that problem. <laughs> uh, uh, he, he fixed that problem, and uh, others have uh, succeeded in fixing that problem yet, uh, yet further since then. So, yeah, I, so I, I trace it back to Newt. I mean, others can say, well, you forgot about Reagan or yeah. Goldwater or the John Birch Society. I'm not like arguing against that uh, thesis. I'm just saying the the demise really accelerated uh, with Newt and that change of generation there from the greatest generation to these cultural warriors uh, who came who rose with the class of '94. Well, in, in the book, you also there's sort of a confluence of factors, right? The time that Newt, you've also got talk radio, mm -hmm. um, you've got big money on the outside. I mean, and you talk about there's four themes that you mm -hmm. talk about in the book. That I think it also. And, uh, do you remember them, or do I wrote them down? Just in, in case. case, in case I have a Rick Perry <laughs> moment. <laughs> just yeah. in case, you can, just in case. <laughs> but but I think those four themes are really imp are critical because I think that's part of what you mm -hmm. see the innovation with Newt, you know, repeating a lie mm -hmm. over and over right. and over with with no shame, mm -hmm. um, and so effectively, and the way that he also undermined faith in government, even mm -hmm. though. Supposedly, they you know were supposed to have the contract with America to get government to right. fix problems. Then that went out mm -hmm. the window. Yeah, so I, I start out with uh, the, the old story of the, the Vince Foster suicide that many many of you may remember, um, which, in light of recent events, comes to take on uh, some more significance. I think you know it, you know it's almost like, I mean, of course, it was devastating for his family and those who knew him. Uh, what what was done with his suicide, which people pretended uh, was a murder, yeah. but uh, it was kind of quaint compared to the big lie in, in its impact. But essentially, he, uh, this uh, friend of the Clintons uh, uh, moved to Washington, uh, 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 deputy counsel in the uh, Clinton White House, was being uh, scapegoated and abused for all kinds of things, particularly by the Wall Street Journal editorial page. Gets very depressed, uh, stops eating, uh, you know, uh, seeks out psychiatrists, writes a suicide note, uh, you know, everything is there. Uh, and he kills himself, and this is investigated over and over again, coming to the same conclusion. The difference this time, there have always been conspiracy theories in our history. The difference this time is you had the Speaker of the House in 1995 saying, I don't buy it. I don't care that it's been investigated four times. You, and you had Dan Burton, who was the chairman of the, the top uh, investigatory committee, proving that Vince Foster was murdered by shooting a melon in his backyard, which would prove naturally. Uh, those of you who have shot melons <laughs> in your backyard know that this proves that, that Vince Foster was murdered and then apparently yeah. rolled up in a carpet and carried 800 feet up a hill somehow without losing any blood and deposited there. And it was all done by Hillary Clinton, th this being the first of about 50 murders, yeah. I believe, yeah. <laughs> yes. that the Clintons were responsible for. So, so that was sort of the... Um, the prototype for um, the, the big lie, and you know, repeated in a much bigger way during the Iraq War, uh, uh, repeated in uh, an, an another sinister way with the talk of the death panels um, uh, by Sarah Palin uh, during the, the Tea Party. Uh, and of course, it then beginning in 2016, the talk of fraud, the beginning of, of sowing distrust in the elections, and then uh, the rest we don't need to relive right now. <laughs> Well, the thing about Vince Foster, too, I, I did happen to know him not well, and I do remember that period, and it was tragic when he died. But the you know the fact that with every new uh, you know investigation, it just kept go it felt like it kept going on and on and on, mm -hmm. and there and there was no sense of decency. I mean, I think that to my mind that was one of the and that's that was part of newtism, if you will. Mm -hmm. There was no decorum. There was no sense that, well, this is hard for his family. We don't need to no. keep dragging them out. There was none of that. Right. So and that's another one, sort of the dehumanizing yes. uh, of opponents uh, that, that I go into. The idea that they are uh, not your opponent, but they are the enemy. So that's another, uh, that's another innovation, uh, the disinformation. Uh, the, uh, Newt also uh, had brought in this group of Republicans who uh, approach the, uh, uh, the right-wing extremism very differently and sort of uh, uh, flirted with the, uh, the, the uh, patriot groups, the militia groups at the time. This is in the run-up to the Oklahoma City bombing. 
So there was a whole uh, different approach of trying to harness the power of the violent right uh, without being consumed by it. That was a tenuous balancing act that, of course, more, more recently has been uh, lost entirely. And this was also the beginning, uh, that revolution in 94, uh, of when the, uh, the Democrats lost their uh, Southern majority. Uh, basically, this was uh, a reaction to what had happened in the 1960s with civil rights, uh, civil rights and voting rights, uh, and Im immigration uh, reform. Uh, but so for the first time, the parties really became aligned by race. Uh, and Newt uh, played the race card which I, I think we'll yeah. talk about in a bit, yeah. uh, uh, extremely well uh, and, uh, uh, and much more vigorously than had been done before, certainly by uh, the Republicans up until that point. Um, and then that was also the beginning of the uh, dysfunction uh, that, we, that is so commonplace today. That was the time, I think the longest shutdown before uh, the Republican Revolution had been three days, and it was sort of a technical thing where the government really did <laughs> keep running. Right. Uh, that was the beginning of the constant uh, defaults and not being able to pass the spending bills and the omnibus bills and the stopgap spending and the constant dysfunction that, is, of course, is what we all live with today. When you mention Oklahoma City, I think what's important to note about that, and it really struck me when I was reading it in the book, how important that moment was because it really it was anti-government and it was violence. And it was, I believe in the book, you talk about Newt's comments mm -hmm. um, were sort of I wouldn't say um, he was sort of not as condemning as you might have expected right. for after the fact. Correct yeah. after you know I, I, given his position. Well, and what's I think alarming about what we're hearing now? In fact, Newt himself is out there now yes. talking about uh, our FBI as the Gestapo, yes. um, uh, saying that they are truly evil, uh, talking about our, our country being on the uh, precipice. Now, if a country is on the precipice because of, <laughs> of right. words like that <laughs> right. um, uh, being used. But that, that rhetoric is strikingly like the rhetoric that we heard in 94 and 95 in the run-up to Oklahoma City. That's when yeah. you know, this was Gordon Liddy was on the radio saying, uh, you know, uh, you should actually kill the sons of bitches, talking about ATF agents. So it was the ATF instead yes. of the FBI. Uh, that was because of the, the earlier uh, Waco raids. Uh, uh, alarmingly similar. The idea, and Republican officials were saying, uh, they're coming to get you. They're out to get you, driving people to uh, hysteria. Right. Uh, and we saw another w uh, period of rhetoric like this before the violence uh, of 2010 and 2011. Uh, so I, you know, I, we've already seen the violent response to the violent rhetoric. This this naturally occurs. So uh, that we're in a uh, sitting on a powder keg now. But that really became. It's again, it's one of the four themes, right? Vi the rhetoric, not just it's it's othering, it's dehumanizing, but it's also um, it's violent rhetoric. But it also gives permission, and they knew very well who who was listening. Mm -hmm. And you also talk about how the militia groups then sort of become Tea Party people, then sort of migrate to some of these online groups. Mm -hmm. um, Right, and then, I mean, the, the Oath Keepers, uh, famous today, uh, were born in the, uh, during the Tea Party, during that time, uh, in a response to uh, the Obama administration. Um, so you also talk, we are going to talk about race, but I want to talk the, about the Supreme Court, because there's two big Supreme Court decisions, I bet you can guess which ones they might be, um, <laughs> that you do talk about that obviously had a, lot, had a huge impact um, on how we got here, mm -hmm. the first one being Cit and Citizens United, and certainly the money in politics. You talk a lot about um, soft money. Mm -hmm. I will share with you when I was at the DNC, <laughs> I worked for Howard Dean, and he said, well, you know, since we don't have to take soft money anymore, that means when donors call, you don't have to listen to their advice about what we should be doing. <laughs> and I thought that was the best. I said, great, I'm all for it. <laughs> However, it was, you know, even though we weren't taking soft money, the 527 groups and sort of Again, this sort of alliance between the way the Republicans have used the levers of power, money, and the, and the, the outside groups, and then the media mm -hmm. really has contributed to this mm -hmm. ascension to being the destructionists. So I want to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, and I would go back uh, to an even earlier Supreme Court decision. Of course, we had uh, Bush v. Gore, and I think that's 
that's the time when people first started to see the, the court as partisan. Uh, in fact, I, uh, I, r I quoted from a, an earlier uh, uh, book that had I think it was, uh, I forgot whose book it was, uh, but uh, uh, Antonin Scalia had privately yes. said, uh, said that ruling was, as we say in Brooklyn, a piece of shit. <laughs> uh, and it was done for the purpose of uh, giving the presidency uh, to George W. Bush. So, uh, uh, but I, I think that was the beginning of this sort of unholy alliance of uh, the, the Supreme Court uh, and uh, the Republican Party. Uh, Mitch McConnell shortly thereafter becomes the Republican leader. He was, he was earlier than that running the uh, the, Repu the Senate Republicans' uh, re-election efforts uh, becomes the um, uh, the Republican whip, but because uh, Bill Frist is not really a very powerful uh, right. a figure, is, is essentially running the Republican Party from around uh, 2003 on, and he makes it uh, his life mission uh, to uh, uh, to uh, stack that court, um, uh, which, uh, of course, I doubt anybody in this room needs a, needs a a primer on uh, on Merrick Garland and uh <laughs> <laughs> and what happened since then. So, I mean, I I uh, uh, I tie that in as well with the uh, uh, the assaults on democracy that have occurred within the system because, of course, the Supreme Court, uh, the uh, Citizens United de decision, the Shelby decision, a lot of what we're seeing uh, in redrawing lines uh, in uh, in the, the dark money. Uh, was set in motion uh, by the Supreme Court, which in turn was set in motion by right. our friend Mitch McConnell. Well, also during the Bush years, um, the the K Street project, the you know um, Tom Delay, Bob Nay, that whole culture of corruption, which was something that we said at the DNC. I mean, it real that it really was in um, overdrive in many ways in terms of the connection with between the Bush administration as well and these groups. And sort of the way they used government. Yes, I, and I've so tried to have to cameos for all of them yeah. in here. You know, there's, you there's did. here comes Matt Drudge, and yeah. there's Jack Abramoff. I even recycled my story about Jake, Jack Abramoff trying to tell me he had found kosher pig. Yes, um, you have to tell that story. Uh, it's yeah, brilliant. He, it, it, uh, and it turns out there may there he he we 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 were lunch buddies, shall we say? Um, he w he was a source of mine. This is before. I knew he was bilking Indian tribes, but uh, he, did you uh, say that in the book, by I, the way, before him? <laughs> uh, but he had said he'd opened a he'd opened a restaurant in a deli, a, co a kosher restaurant uh, downtown. It was a deli called uh, Stacks, and he said he was he had found uh, kosher pigs, uh, and was going to have um, um, kosher bacon, therefore in in his restaurant, um, which I you know I didn't think of anything at the time, but of course. That if I'd understood <laughs> what that meant, I could have had the, I could have broken the whole Jack Abramoff right. story <laughs> instead of Sue Schmidt. I, I realized what this guy was onto. But then more recently, I looked it up, and darned if there aren't kosher pigs. <laughs> uh, there, I think they're in Indonesia or something. But there was only one problem: they were endangered. Uh. So, <laughs> it, at least until we fix that problem, we are not going to have kosher bacon. All but right. Th I'm sorry, that that was an <laughs> aside. But I'm just trying to to say there are, there. Are uh, you'll find a lot of unexpected characters yes. herein. There were some very colorful characters who came to light during the Bush years, not the least of which was Karl Rove. Who <laughs> so if we had Newt Gingrich, then we had Karl Rove. And, and, uh, and uh, another small fact, if you have the, a copy of the book here tonight, you'll see that Matt Gates is there. And you may further no no notice that Matt Gates is not really in the book. I mean, it, you know, he's mentioned here or there. And um, this came as a surprise to me as well. But I will tell you tonight uh, that that was supposed to be Karl Rove. <laughs> and uh -oh. he was switched out apparently at the last minute by the art department for the, for the well thought out reason of they made a mistake. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's not like Karl Rove refused so to have his image Right, on the so if, we okay. <coughs> if it survives into a reprint, this he will be replaced uh, by Karl Rove. All right. Um, but you talk a lot about Rove, and obviously there's always been a lot of conversation about the, his vision of the permanent Republican realignment, mm -hmm. which I would say he did a pretty good job, if you look at where we are right now, in terms of how many of the levers of power they actually control in terms of elections, in terms of not just in yeah. Congress, state legislatures. Um, talk a little about Karl well, Rove. Well, but Karl Rove envisioned a Republican realignment where they'd have a majority of the voters, which is yes. entirely different from 
the realignment uh, that came about. Uh, but it was it was uh, it was Rowe's view, and I, this is this was his singular innovation uh, after the uh, the 9/11 uh, terrorist attacks that Republicans could win by running on the war. Uh, you know, Liz Cheney at the in the last hearing of the January 6 committee spoke about the the, the trouble of, of Donald Trump weaponizing patriotism, mm -hmm. and that's exactly what uh, happened in the administration of her father. Uh, and when you know people like uh, Max Cleland, a triple amputee from uh, Vietnam, were uh, made to look as if they're aiding and abetting Osama bin Laden and, and Saddam Hussein, you know the swift voting of John Kerry, uh, saying if you vote for Democrats, we're going to get hit again and worse than the first time. Uh, so this th that was the innovation of the Rove years and of the Cheney years um, that has come back. Uh, now, and uh, as I call it, like a Greek tragedy, coming back right. to destroy his own daughter. Yeah. Right, but also to use that as a weapon against Democrats. Um, you talk about some of the way they really, you know, we were aiding and abetting the the enemy, and and um, and again, just that rhetoric, that that tone of the rhetoric, continuing to sort of ratchet itself up. Um, you know, one of the things that I that I want I was thinking about that I just thought I'd ask you about, it you know, Democrats haven't didn't do a very good job, I think, of pushing back on that. It's like we, you know, we were we didn't want to be and still don't I think quite as mean, and I can and as, and for new to say you know Republicans have to learn to be meaner. You know, in Democratic yeah. circles we always say, if only we were meaner, but we're just okay. not going to do that. Well, it's it's sort of an asymmetric fight. All right. So you have you have one side that is, you know, I, I, I think the Washington Post fact checkers count was thirty thousand falsehoods uttered by Donald Trump during his presidency. So you have one side that's living by alternative facts. Uh, now, of course, if the Democrats could do that too and make up a whole <laughs> bunch of conspiracy theories about who thus and such killed, but then of course you've already lost the battle. Uh, you know, they could, I, su I suppose, uh, you know, match the white nationalism with a more virulent, uh, 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 you know, multicultural uh, uh, assault. But what's the point? I mean, a yeah. further, a further tearing apart Americans. Uh, you know, you can't go down the violence route. So I think it is true that Democrats uh, have always been uh, very difficult to get on message. <laughs> I'm sure, th though you though you've tried, yeah. uh, they're n they're not very good at, at following instructions. Um, uh, they tend to be a, a bit uh, disordered, and you know I think they you know they care an awful lot about uh, uh, policies, you know, yeah. s silly things Truth. like that. Um, so, I, uh, <laughs> but so I in part I you can blame them, but but you, you you don't necessarily blame them. But what I think needs to happen now, regardless of what got us to this point, is. People need to uh, speak up about what's happening mm -hmm. uh, to the country, and I think you know there's a tendency among Democrats to say, "Well, the public doesn't want to hear, you know, about uh, January 6th and you know the threats to democracy." Well, too bad the public's got to hear about this, or there's you know, there's going to be no American public. Right. Um, we are going to be taking questions in a moment, but I and I want to remind you that when we finish, I'm going to say it now, Alyssa. So do it. You can buy the book in the back. And then you can have your book signed um, by Dana. So, Dana, let's talk about race because that is the other big piece of how we got to this moment. The Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, you know, Democrats, the, you know, the, we, the Republicans then, the Southern strategy, mm -hmm. uh, which has been turned into, you know, the art of grievance politics, mm -hmm. I would say, with, with Trump. But race and the, ch the fear of change mm -hmm. uh, in this country, I think, has dr been a huge factor in driving, yeah. would you say, the effectiveness of the Republican strategy, Because meaning there was a, an audience that was ripe mm -hmm. for, the, for it. Right. I think race is the single most important factor in explaining Trump uh, and in explaining what has happened to the Republican Party. Um, this is all... Uh, part of a white backlash against this emerging multicultural majority uh, in America that happens, you know, in t the year 2045, this becomes a white minority nation. Now, this was set in motion back in the 1960s yeah. 
um, and uh, you, you mentioned uh, Nixon's uh, Southern strategy, but uh, what is what is developed over time is okay. So Republicans uh, base voters are a losing demographic. It's becoming a, 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 a the the white vote, particularly white male vote, becoming a smaller and smaller part of America. White male, non college educated. Um, what uh, there was an uh, autopsy, as you probably have heard right. about, that was done in 2012, and, re and Republicans, after Mitt Romney's loss, Republicans have lost the popular vote in seven of the last eight uh, presidential elections, with the exception of the war election in, in, in 2004. The autopsy said if we're going to survive as a party, you've got to appeal to black voters, uh, Latinos, uh, uh, Asian Americans, gay voters. I was just saying, the, the autopsy was done by Reince Priebus, who at the time was, and you yes. talk about this in the book, who at the time was the RNC chairman. Mm -hmm. so. Right. Um, and uh, immediately after that, Republicans came out and defeated in the House and uh, defeated uh, uh, comprehensive immigration reform. So they, 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 they told right. the party what <laughs> they could do with their right. autopsy report. Right. And, and Trump's innovation was to, was, and he was, he was not wrong about this, was the idea is if you can stoke the fears of that white minority, uh, then they're going to turn out and vote in huge numbers. So, you know, for example, white uh, evangelical uh, Protestants are 15% or so uh, of this country, but they're 25% of the electorate uh, during, uh, uh, during Trump's elections. Are checking with the pollster over here. Checking with the pollster. And they were 40% of, of Trump's uh, voters. Um, so in, in a sense, you're defying gravity because you can get, you can tell, uh, you know, uh, you tell these anxious, non-college educated white voters, you know, great replacement theory. You are, you're, you're losing your country. You're, you're losing your uh, identity. Uh, that fear is motivating. And that still can win elections. Now, it's not going to win elections 20 years from now, right. um, but it, it certainly can win elections in the short term. So that's why, uh, you know, I'm optimistic, you know, in the long run, you know, d d uh, demographics will prevail and this backlash uh, will subside because this will, this will become a, a, a more and more apparent uh, minority. The problem is what do we do uh, until, uh, until we get to that point? <laughs> Are we going to have any of our democracy left? So that's why we need, uh, uh, you know, small d Democrats need to uh, mobilize uh, and uh, uh, actually recognize the threat and talk about the threat and not shut up about it. But so this is the thing about that, Dana, because there are conversations happening. There's issue one. There's different organizations that are trying to work on different parts of this. At the same time, it sort of feels like, I mean, running on Save Democracy, eh, that's not, you know, that's not really mm -hmm. mobilizing. Um, save women's reproductive freedom, that's working, so that's something. And that is actually connected to saving democracy. But, you know, ironically, it feels like it's happening right before our eyes. I mean, as you point out in the book, the threads have been, they've been pulling on the threads. But right now, when we see all of these um, big lie believers and who are winning races, and not just congressional races, and then this is the thing that I think is maybe the innovation sort of post-Trump, they're now running for attorney general races, for state legislative races, for um, secretaries of state, because they want to control the levers of democracy mm -hmm. on top of having passed legislation to make it harder for people of color to vote and easier for their voters to vote. Right, and it does feel just in these last few weeks that things have begun to change, that uh, people have begun um, uh, to wake up. You've seen it in the enthusiasm of Democratic voters. Um, uh, you've seen it in e extraordinary turnouts, uh, in special elections, in primaries. Um, and, uh, you know, I, should, I actually should thank Donald Trump and, and Kevin McCarthy for their hysterical reaction to the legitimate court-ordered search yes. at uh, Mar-a-Lago for whipping up this frenzy to illustrate uh, just what, uh, what the destructionists are doing. So I think, I think Donald Trump... Actually, and I can report just this evening uh, that it's now number five on the New York Times list. So that <laughs> we, we want to thank, thank, Donald, thank Donald Trump for, for getting us there. But, uh, well, thank Donald Trump and thank all of the people who then went out and threatened FBI agents. I mean, you yes. got you to gotta 
throw them yes, in I, there too. I, I, I have to rewrite the acknowledgments. Yes, I think you should. As yeah. as well, you should. So let's let's go back to something else you said and end on hope because I will, as Lissa said, it's a tough read. I mean, I it's such an important book because what I will say is again, it's all been happening in front of our eyes. I mean, I feel like this is my career in Washington, but seeing it all together in one place with the very clear you know, Oklahoma City to January 6th, like some very clear through lines that, you know, if you're in your day to day, it's harder to, to see. But what gives you hope? Because you do end with a bit of, a little bit of hope and we've talked about it a little bit, but let's, let's talk, let's talk about what's hopeful about and why we think the next generation. And I always feel bad because I feel like saying, hey guys, you're going to fix it. Sorry. Right. Well, right. Is hopeful is just another way of saying we're punting, right? right. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, perhaps. Our children will take care of this and our grandchildren. Um, well, I'm hopeful for that reason of, of, of demography, that the, the country's changing. You, even, if you, even if you built the wall and you didn't let one more person in from any direction, even from Canada, it's the, uh, the con the, these dem demographic changes are happening. Um, uh, and uh, this, this backlash will subside. So. That, that's why I'm hopeful. I'm not at all hopeful in the short term, um, but that's why I'm s telling people to, to wake up and uh, let's let's get let's get going here. So, do we is part of the problem that you've had Republicans articulating a very clear vision using the levers of power? The me we didn't even get to talk about the media and mm -hmm. social media, and that there it doesn't feel that there has been a consistent. I won't just put it on Democrats. Yeah. But there really is, what's the counter? There doesn't, I mean, is that part of why we have been so susceptible to the destructionist? There, I mean, there, as we said earlier, it's, it's asymmetric. There is no equal and opposite um, right. counter. So um, I w you, could, you can blame the, uh, the media, the enemy of the people. You <laughs> right. can blame uh, uh, Democrats like yourself. Um, um, and well, that may be satisfying to some extent, but I think even if even if everybody was doing it right, yeah. um, I don't. I think this is a this was a this was a larger problem than that. So I want to absolve you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Thank I, I appreciate uh, your, that. It's not your fault. Well, I do. I will say, I do think that Democrats need to learn how to talk about race, because I think that it, it is an area where if we were able, you, know, you and I talked about this the other day, in 2016 when people said. I'm worried my kid's future isn't going to be as good as my, you know, my, mine was. We said $15 minimum wage, and we said health care. Mm -hmm. And Donald Trump said, well, that's their fault. That's not your fault. That's their fault. Come with me. And, and it, it worked. And, it, and that's what mobilized people was just that anger. And there wasn't really a, a way to make people, you know, we didn't talk about race, I think, in a way that made people feel included. This is your problem now. <laughs> Thanks, Dana. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Appreciate it. So I think it's probably time to um, ask folks to line up for questions. Again, if you have a question, please go to the microphone. I'm going to, ch <clears throat> even though I only have one vocal cord, I'm going to channel my former MSNBC host self, <laughs> and it's really got to be a question. Um, I will probably ask you to close if it's not a question, but please, any, yes? Okay, so this may be a combination of questions, but you keep on referring to the Democrats and the Republicans. I'm just wondering how you identify and, um, or whether, you, you know, you don't. Um, and more to the point, um, I haven't, I don't agree with the fact that this has been such a great thing, if I understood what you were saying, um, the raid on Mar-a-Lago. And I'm wondering, actually, what is the Democratic message that will be the most succinct and the most compelling? So, so <laughs> that is a, a different uh, session. Um, <laughs> that well, I, that's the, uh, that's but the key thing. If there's a qu but so if there's a question about the book. Yeah. Let you go to that. Um, I am a, I'm a registered independent, okay. which means in the District of Columbia I have no vote. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, but yeah, as I as I argue in the book, I'm a partisan for uh, small D Democrats, and I think we in the media, it's okay to be advocates and partisans for democracy. 
so that's, uh, and unfortunately at this moment, de yeah. small D Democrats and, and big D Democrats are, are tend to be this in the same universe. Has it gotten harder as a journalist to be a small D Democrat and advocate for democracy without being told you're well, I'm, I'm an a liberal. I'm, I'm an opinion journalist, so I'm not, I'm <laughs> not afraid of, uh, of those labels. I think, I, I think that's why we in the media uh, allowed Donald Trump to rise in 2016 with unfiltered uh, and uncritical coverage. We weren't used to the, a the asymmetry uh, at the time. But I think, no, I think, I think we as, a, as an industry, uh, the fake news media have, have, have caught up. <laughs> oh, good. And that's not fake. Oh well, I mean, I, it's, it's not unrelated in the sense that I'm not, I'm not a, I'm, I, I don't help Democrats come up with messages. Yeah, I, right. And and if I did, they'd probably lose. I'd say right. not. not it's <laughs> and really we wouldn't not ask my thing. you to. Karen does it. My my yeah. wife does yeah. it. But that, I like I said, that's another session. We'll do that one together. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, one message could be uh, get people to come out and vote in the midterms. That's always the failure of yeah. the Democrats. But uh, I just wanted to get sh you said you're an opinion person, so I was just thinking we keep hearing about the fragileness of democracy, and it starts to get me thinking because I grew up here, very safe inside the Beltway, and uh, since the Eisenhower Kennedy years, so um, I just think you know, oh well, we thought we defeated evil World War II kind of thing, and I'm thinking, well, they see a free society here, open society here, they just migrate over here. <coughs> so my point being about protecting democracy and protecting the future, we get complacent after certain generations come along. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I just wonder question? what your yeah. thoughts about long-term evil, <laughs> you know? Well, I, I think that the, this story of, you know, the re revolution of uh, 94 was very much a changing of generation, as I indicated earlier. You know, you, uh, the greatest generation who fought World War II together, they recognize that the guy across the aisle is not my enemy. You know, he's my opponent, we disagree, but he's not my enemy. Um, and that changed when Newt Gingrich started talking about the other side as traitors. Not only do I disagree with them, but they're disloyal to the United States of America. And that repeated itself uh, with the, the Karl Rove and uh, Dick Cheney, and it certainly has been a, been a key feature of the Trump years. And the Tea Party really reinforced that. Yes, sir. Um, I've never had an answer to a question I've been po posing for about a year and a half. Uh, shortly after January 6th, uh, there were reports that Republican staffers or co even congresspersons had um, uh, guided people through the uh, Capitol uh, before January 6th, uh, oh. given the maps and so forth. Do you have any, I, I haven't read the book yet. I don't know whether you touch on that in the book or any comments on it. Well, I, I think we're still waiting for the, uh, the January 6th Select Committee to uh, come out with that. So it would be very impressive if I were able to scoop them on that <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah, and report. But yeah, I, I, there's, there certainly hasn't been anything uh, published on that. It's been alleged, but so far we don't have the, we haven't seen the evidence yet. Hi, so my question touches a little bit on um, what you were just talking about in terms of like the next generation. Um, so I am 20 years old, essentially like what we've been discussing all night is what myself, my friends that I came with, that's what we've known our whole lives. You know, starting with being born like two months after 9-11, you know, the crash in 08, I literally voted for the first time in 2020 because that's when I was old enough to. So my question is what advice do you have for my generation that really feels like we're fighting an uphill battle right now and even us turning out big time in 2020 you know feels like it's not getting us as far as it should so well what gives me hope about your generation um, uh, my daughter's generation is because uh, yes you you, you you grew up in a, a pretty, uh, some pretty awful times uh, in our country. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but you, you also grew up in, uh, in a very beneficial way uh, as well because your generation, for the first time, accepts uh, 
multiracial, multicultural America as totally the norm. Um, uh, you, d you, you don't uh, see race the way older generations do. Uh, so that backlash that's driving all of these horrors um, uh, will end with your generation. And it's not just you know, somebody here in Washington, D.C. This is, this is true in red and uh, in blue America, and you can see it uh, uh, in the attitudes that we in, in young voters. Uh, whether it's uh, t towards uh, climate change, whether it's towards uh, uh, gay Americans, whether it's uh, t towards uh, uh, people of color, uh, you have very different views. You will become the, it's not just that there's a multicultural majority, it's a, uh, a majority in favor of that multicultural America, even among uh, white people. That's what's gonna change the country. You guys are gonna change this country for the better. So it's our job to try to make sure that there's still a few threads left <laughs> that you can <laughs> stitch back together. Uh, so that's what we're, we're, we're it's, this is a rear guard action to try to keep things going long enough so that there's still some muscle memory left. I think I, that was a terribly mixed metaphor there. A lot of stuff I think it's a good there. point though, like a lot of us have faith in like what this country can be. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's tough sometimes. <laughs> it is. Constantly scrolling through Twitter and just seeing. Don't like, do, don't do that. Yeah, no, don't, don't do that. Yes. Don't doom don't scroll. Do that. Would Did highly you see Spider Man? The young kid who's played Spider Man, he's off Twitter because it's bad for his mental health. <laughs> don't do it. That's what you can do. In the meantime, get off Twitter and you'll be okay. fine. Sounds good. <laughs> Thank you. Which, <laughs> which threads do you think are the strongest at this point? Because you do, you talk a lot about the threads of democracy. So which are, which are still strong? Um, I, you know, I actually haven't asked that, so I haven't really, I haven't been asked that, so I haven't really uh, thought about it. Um, um, look, I think uh, our federal system probably is what's still strongest. The states and the state governments are very strong. Now, it's causing a huge division between blue states uh, and red states, but there is a, a huge bulwark against this, these anti-democratic tendencies in blue America from these states, and the states in our system uh, have a lot of power. So I think that is one piece of it that really has not been uh, affected at all by this. Okay. I'll take that. Hi, um, so your, your narrative about Newt Gingrich starting the sort of federal trend that Republicans have been on for quite some time, but what about the state level? I mean, the Republicans have such dominance in so many states at the legislative level. Is that all started with Gingrich too? Is that a different story? Are the stories related? I mean, why why aren't why are the Republicans so much more successful at the state level? Well, there will uh, we were speaking of cameos in there, so there'll be a cameo for the the Koch brothers and Alec and and what they've been uh, successful at, at doing um, at the state level. A very deliberate uh, a, a very deliberate effort. Um, yeah, it mirrors what's, hap what's happened at, at the national level. Um, but as we were just saying a moment ago, that's, uh, uh, um, there's, a, there's a pretty sharp division <laughs> between what's going on in red states and, and blue states. And I think people have to recognize their own power at the state level, too. Yep. We have time for two more questions. Right on. Yes, yeah. And there they are. Or there's one of two. <laughs> Hi, um, my partner and I just got your book in the mail, so we're really excited to read it. Um, I'm from Michigan, and there's a lot of tension in that state for- I haven't heard, <laughs> tell me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, a lot of complexity in our state, um, but also a lot of complexity in our personal lives, I think, as we're interfacing with people across the aisle. I have a lot of family members, friends who are Republicans, and I've seen their rhetoric in my own lifetime become like more extreme. Um, so I, I get the sense, and we just got it, so I haven't <laughs> gotten into it yet. I get the sense this book is mostly about elected officials and people within government. But I was wondering if there's any takeaways that you have um, about how we can be interfacing with our Republican people in our lives in ways that might, I don't know, counteract some of the things that are happening in government. I mean, I know that sounds kind of naive because these things are larger than us, yeah. but it feels more productive, I think, personally, to be able to say something to the people in my own life um, and be effective yeah. there. Um, 
You know, it's, it's interesting what's happening in America is that's what you're describing there is a bit of an anomaly because um, we've become segregated by party, so much so that, you know, people we, uh, uh, where we live, for example, here, <laughs> um, you know, how we worship, um, um, you know, where we send our kids to school, everything is basically segregated. Media, uh, media everything is segregated. Um, by party now, um, so uh, and you know it, it, it occurs uh, often because that's often by race and religion within families. Uh, there's there's less and less division um, um, than there used to be. Um, so I, I'm not sure I'm in the best position, um, you know, coming from a, a, a Jewish family from the coast. I don't have family members who you know that's um, that's the nature of, of, of how we uh, how we live today. Now, I will say that having written this book about the destructionists, the, the right is very good at projection, and there's <laughs> it, what's to the extent I've heard from things from Fox News and um, uh, the Daily Signal, it's been, you're the destructionist. Uh, <laughs> you're using uh, this harsh language against us. Um, so, um, uh, you know, I don't know what you do in a family situation, but I do know what you do, uh, I mean, in a societal situation is always uh, be uh, respectful and polite, but not at all shy away from uh, the argument and right. the, the, the verbal fight, not the fisticuffs. <laughs> and keep it polite. You don't have to go to harsh rhetoric or violent rhetoric, right? Do I see anyone? Okay, no, I think that's it. Those are all our questions. Well, um, before I say thank you, remember, buy a book in the back. Uh, and you can pay in the back and then get in line and have it signed by the one and only Dana Milbank. Please join me in thanking Thank you, Dana. guys. Thank you.